Hey everybody, Brett from Astartes Gaming here, back with another Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord developer blog video. Uh, kind of something a little bit different this week. I'm going to merge last week's blog in with uh, this week's blog because they're both fairly short. Um, I actually wasn't going to do last week's blog, uh, the one you're looking at right now about scabbards. I wasn't going to do it at all. Um, but again, because this week's and last week's was so short and somebody requested that I uh, look at it this way, I figured, you know, what the hell, why not? So um, just going to give you a quick rundown of last week's and then we'll jump into this week. So this is uh, the blog for April 12th, 2018. And it's about scabbards. It's not not very interesting. Um, so essentially what they're talking about here is just uh, in Warband, for example, you had most of your weapons represented on your body. Um, you know, so you had four weapon slots and if you were carrying four weapons, they would all show up for the most part, unless, of course, they both sat in the same um, uh, slot. So, for example, if you had like a one, two, like two one-handed swords, for example, um, only one of them would ever show up on your body. Uh, in Bannerlord, they've changed that, so now even if you have two one-handed swords or like two one-handed weapons or two two-handed weapons, they will show up on your body anyways. So all of your stuff will be represented now rather than just... Um, most of it. And the other big thing is that they have added physics to them so they'll actually kind of, you know, jingle around and stuff when you move. And that's that's really all last week's blog was talking about. So again, that's why I didn't really bother. But now you've got a quick rundown of it just in case you were interested. And with that, let's jump back to or actually I can just punch it in right here. And we'll jump to the next one. Which is about weapons. And this is just going to be a rundown of the various types of weapons that will be in game, at least in terms of melee weapons. Um, I assume they're going to give us something about ranged weapons next week, unless they decide to break it up with maybe a Q&A or something instead, which uh, I don't know if I really care. Anyways, let's see. So, greetings, warriors of Calradia. Medieval warfare was a, or excuse me, was as brutal and terrifying as you might imagine. Soldiers fought for their lives in ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat using a variety of different weapons to protect themselves and defeat their, defeat their opponents. Pole arms, swords, maces, and axes were used to devastating effect, and anyone unlucky enough to be on the receiving end of a blow from one of these vicious weapons of war would certainly know about it. For those already familiar with Mountain Blade games, you will already know what kinds of weapons you can expect to see on the battlefields of Kelradia. But for those that are new to the series, we thought this would be a good opportunity to introduce you to the selection of melee weapons which you will have at your disposal in Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. This is something I think they should have done much earlier. At this point in the game's development, I'm pretty sure most people are aware of the types of weapons they can expect. Or at least they could have guessed based on videos and stuff. This should have been something again that happened a lot earlier but here it is so i'm gonna cover it anyways um before we move on it would probably be helpful for us to explain the different types of damage you can inflict in bannerlord uh this i think is well it's not really new information um we haven't heard what types of damage there are on bannerlord before but it looks to be the exact same as warband so it's not really new uh, we use these three different types of damage for melee weapons blunt piercing and cut uh, or like slashing. A single weapon can perform a different type of damage depending on which attack you use. So if we take swords as an example, a thrust attack would cause piercing damage, whereas a slash would perform cutting damage. The different types of damage are affected by the type of armor they come into contact with. Cutting damage is more effective against light armor. Piercing damage is more effective against heavy armor, and blunt damage falls somewhere in between the two, giving a more consistent result across the board. I'm not sure that I find that to be like super accurate generally the best way to defeat plate armor was to just like batter the hell out of the person in it piercing a uh, good plate was very difficult and generally you didn't pierce the plate so much as pierced areas around the plate um in you know spaces where there was openings um it, it's rare that you would try to stab through like a chest plate um it did happen, it just wasn't a great way to approach it. But, you know, if you had a Warhammer, you could just ring 
ring the chest plate like a bell and the person wearing it wouldn't be too pleased with that. Um, probably, you know, get knocked on their ass. So, I I mean, not to say that like a Warhammer would be less effective against Chainmail, because it would still be pretty effective. And, I mean, I guess it would be more consistent, but honestly, I, I just don't see piercing as, again, being effective against heavy, unless unless you're considering heavy to be chainmail, in which case, yeah, piercing, but see, I would consider chainmail to be, like, medium armor, um, if uh, they're not really discussing what they're considering each type of armor to be, but if you just gave me those three categories, I would say light, probably, like, a gambeson, you know, like, quilted, padded armor, uh, medium would be, like, chainmail, and then heavy would be, like, plate. Now, it depends on the time period. I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of plate here, but they seem to kind of be pulling from all over the place, so it's hard to say. Most of the uh, most of the armors and stuff seem to be taken from, like, the 11th century, roughly. So we do see a lot of chain mail. We see some, like, lamellar and some... I think there's some scale. I'm, I'm pretty sure we've seen some scale. So maybe that's what they're considering heavy, in which case, yes, piercing would be pretty effective against that. But, um, again, it's just, it's kind of vague here, so it's hard to, hard to say for sure. All right, so anyways, into the weapons. First, we've got daggers. Daggers are one of the most common weapons throughout the history of warfare. They are small, fast, and lethal, making them a great tool for fighting in close quarters. In medieval combat, they were traditionally used for exploiting gaps in armor, such as the armpits or the slit of a visor. Uh, again, not stabbing through plates around them. <laughs> uh, or for finishing off a seriously wounded foe. To reflect this, we decided that daggers shouldn't be able to block incoming attacks. See right there? Completely false. Um, so players should make use of good movement and precise timing to use them effectively. You can block with daggers. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be able to block with daggers. In fact, um... The few instances of, like, dual wielding you see historically, generally, the offhand would be holding a dagger to, um, block in, I don't know that you would necessarily counterattack with it, I mean, you could, it is a weapon, but, um, you know, you'd have, like, a rapier in the right hand and, like, a, a dagger in the left, or vice versa, depending on what your dominant hand is, but daggers in those cases were used predominantly defensively and so there's really no reason why you shouldn't be able to use a dagger defensively at all um, really it just handicaps them to be honest and I uh, it's the same way in warband you can't block with knives and daggers and so I don't think anybody actually uses them unless they're throwing daggers or something but there's better throwing weapons so why wouldn't you just use those and those other throwing weapons if you use them as melee weapons you can block whereas the dagger, even a throwing dagger, can't. So, yeah, I just, I never understood that. I think it really handicaps up his weapons. It gives you um, a pretty good reason not to use them, whereas every other weapon has, uh, you know, pretty good reasons to use them. So, I, I think that's stupid. It's kind of not historically accurate, and, you know, I just don't get that des design decision at all. I don't really see why they're already handicapped by reach, um, you, of course, you get a speed advantage, but, you know, if somebody can hit you with a, a pole arm from, you know, 10 feet away, does that matter? In my opinion, no. So, yeah, I don't know. I just don't, I don't get that decision. And it's one that they've been pretty consistent about, so I, I'm not sure what their misconception is there. Uh, anyway, swords. Swords are one of the most iconic images that come to mind when thinking of medieval combat. They come in many different shapes and sizes, from arming swords through to the intimidating long swords of the late medieval era. In Bannerlord, we have a huge selection of swords for the players to choose between, as well as the ability to craft your own. They are generally faster than other weapons and can be used to bully and harass lesser skilled opponents. Again, um, they seem to just kind of be taking what they want from history, regardless of when. Um, Long swords were, I mean, they, they mention it here, but they were a later thing, and they don't seem to mind putting that into Bannerlord, which again is set fairly early. But, you know, I guess 
it just adds more variety to the weapons, even though it is sort of ahistorical. Whatever they, want, whatever they want to do, I guess. I mean, it is a fantasy setting, so they don't have to strictly adhere to history. It just, you know, it looks a little bit weird at times when you have, you know, just a historical stuff happening with very historically based stuff happening next to it. But whatever. Moving on. Axes. Just like swords, axes come in many shapes and sizes. Historically, they were quite cheap to make and required a limited amount of skill to use, but they were still effective nonetheless. In Bannerlord, two-handed axes actually require quite a bit of player skill to use effectively. You need to control the space between you and your opponent in order to successfully land hits with the heads of axes. Okay. Um, that's good, I guess, because in Warband, they didn't require any skill. You could just get a two-handed axe and spam it, and you would just kind of, like, use it as a scythe to, like, thresh all the... the wheat or people in front of you, but if they're a little bit trickier now, I'm I'm cool with that. So moving on to uh, blunt weapons, such as hammers and maces. Uh, as the arms race between weapons and armor really began to pick up pace during the medieval era, blunt weapons really came to the fore as a direct response to the more advanced techniques used in armor crafting. Even if an attack would fail to penetrate the armor, the full impact could be carried through the armor and into the body, causing severe damage. Yeah, I mean, blunt force trauma is a pretty effective tool. If you can't penetrate somebody's armor, you know, breaking the bones underneath it works just as well a lot of the time. In Bannerlord, blunt weapons act as a kind of jack-of-all-trades and can be used to good effect against all types of armor. However, they can never really excel against a particular armor type in the same way that cutting or piercing weapons and attacks can. See, again, I just, I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, even taking into consideration the various armor things, um, you would be better off trying to, like, pierce a gambeson than, you know... Well, no, that's not true. Never mind. Anyways, let's not get too much into it. We've gotten a little bit too deep into the other things, so we'll just keep pushing through. Pole arms. The clue is very much in the name when it comes to pole arms, a catch-all term for a wide variety of weapons which are attached to a pole. The main advantage of pole arms was their reach, and in the case of weapons such as spears, their versatility and ease of use. Spears could be used in dense formations against infantry and cavalry alike, and they could be thrust or thrown. In Bannerlord, we have many different types of pole arms, including spears, lances, pikes, etc. Um, they are strong against cavalry and extremely good in group fights, but are outmatched more often than not in one-on-one -on -one scenarios. Again, not really not really adhering to history or reality there. Um, pole arms are perf perfectly good one-on-one -on -one weapons. I mean, like, having reach is a nice thing to have when you're fighting somebody, and so um, yeah, it's pole arms are generally more battlefield weapons. It's not to say that they aren't good, like one on one weapons. Um, you know, a, a spear can be used pretty effectively in one on one fight, especially to keep somebody at a distance and attack on your terms rather than um, constantly defending on theirs. But fine, I guess. Eh, anyway, another thing to note about pole arms is if they are too large, as with pikes, then they will be dropped to the ground if you switch to your sidearm. That's kind of cool. I, I like that, actually. That's very realistic, unlike some of the other things in here. So if you have, like, a giant um, pike, you know, that's very much a battlefield weapon. You can't exactly, uh, you know, put that in a pocket or, you know, tuck it into your belt, can you? So you'll have to drop it you know, go fight with your sword and then maybe go back and pick it up later. Whereas, um, I'm assuming the spears and stuff, they'll maybe get thrown on your back. That's not super realistic, but I, I understand the compromise there. It would be annoying if, like, every weapon you, you switched away from got dropped on the ground. So we'll have to see, like, what that cutoff is. But if it's just, you know, the really long stuff, like pikes, maybe lances, because those are kind of unwieldy too... Um, I'd be okay with that. And then finally, farm tools. So finally, we have a selection of tools which wouldn't be the go-to choice for any professional soldier, but is all that some people might have had access to. You shouldn't expect too much in terms of battlefield performance from these, 
but we don't think that the game would have felt complete without them. After all, it's almost harvesting season. They had to squeeze a meme in there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these are cool to have around, especially for, like, the recruit-level troops, um, you know, in early medieval periods, I mean, even into, like, the late stuff, people generally sort of, uh, the whole, it's the whole idea of, like, the citizen soldier, you kind of brought your own equipment for the most part. There were professional soldiers that, you know, were outfitted, but that, that's like a much later thing. During feudal periods, you know, people sort of just fought with what they had. If you were poor, you were generally less well equipped than somebody who was a little bit wealthier. And so to have the recruits in this game, you know, fighting with pitchforks, maybe like wood cutting axes, things like that, it, it makes sense. It definitely makes sense. And it's just a little bit more immersive. So I'm cool with it. And that's going to be all for uh, this week. Again, I think they'll probably go ranged weapons next week, but they could go, you know, a different direction to try to break it up. Um, it definitely seems like they're running out of stuff, though. Maybe it's just me. But, you know, again, this is something that you probably would have expected to see a lot earlier. And so the fact that they're pulling it now to me feels like a reach, like they're just kind of grasping for things to cover. So... Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It'd be nice to see the game soon, but we haven't really heard any informa information on that. They were talking about big things happening um, in, like, spring of this year, and it's the end of April now, and we still haven't seen anything. So, unfortunately, it's not a great sign. Um, I'm not one of those people that doesn't think the game is going to come out. It's going to come out. We just don't know how long it's going to take them, and hopefully it's sooner than later. But, yeah, um... If they are desperate for stuff, again, I would still like to see a lot more on the single-player campaign. We still don't know everything about it. I'd like to get a better idea of just how, you know, the general gameplay of that works. Because we, we don't know. We've seen a little bit of the thief system. We've seen... Um, I think they did a little bit on, like, companions and stuff. But we, we don't know exactly how you know how close it is to warbands gameplay or how different and that's something i'd like to get clarified so if they're again that desperate how about something like that anyways we'll leave it here and uh, let me know what you guys thought about the the uh, blogs this week and last week but anyways thank you so much for watching i had a great time talking about some banner lord with you and i look forward to seeing you guys back here uh, for next week's blog 